Well, good morning, College Church. It's good to see each and every one of you. I used to say it's good to see your smiling faces, but as I tell my daughter every day, smile with your eyes. So it's good to see your smiling eyes this morning. Those of you who are joining us online, we're so uh, welcome. We want to welcome you as well. I'm thankful to be each, with each and every one of you this morning. When we worship together, it's a highlight of my week. And can you give me an amen on that? Amen. All right, we have a few announcements as we get started this morning. First, we rejoice with one of our college students, Davis Buckley, who was baptized Sunday, August the 30th by Hunter Dennison at the College Church. We have these announcements for people who are sick or who have suffered a loss in their family. Alvin Leach, who is the brother-in-law of Gene Kelly and Barbara Newsom, passed away on Friday evening. His funeral arrangements are still pending, but we ask that you keep this family in your prayers. Congratulations to Mary Woody, who is the proud great-grandmother of Aliyah, who was born August the 31st to Cord and Cheyenne of Orlando, of Orlando, Florida. Also, one of our former members, Julie Dottie, who served years and years and years in our office, asked for prayers as she will have surgery this Friday, September the 11th in Oklahoma to remove a large tumor on her spine. If you'll please continue to remember Julie during this time. I want to remind you that when it comes communion time, you have the collapsible little communion cups. Be sure that you hang on to those and throw those away as you exit the auditorium this morning. That would be very helpful to us. Also, tomorrow is Labor Day, so the church office will be closed to observe that holiday. And also, we encourage you to keep an eye on Facebook and also on our email and other social media for any important updates that may happen throughout the week. Let me lead us into worship with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Since therefore we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Let's worship together this morning. Let's stand for our first two songs. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. pray with me. 
Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that you have today given us to worship, sing praise, and fellowship. Lord, we're blessed to have our elders that are in place at this time, and we continue that you uh, give them wisdom as they guide us through this challenging time. We're also thankful for the many servants that we have here at College Church of Christ that enables us to continue to have these services and also the uh, many ministries that we're unstable and able to work with. Lord, we pray for the safety of the team that went down to Louisiana to assist in the, uh, mer the emergency relief and by their actions that, you, uh, that they touch someone and cause them to be closer to you. Lord, we pray for those that are sick and they're, and they're separated from their families and that you give them uh, peace and strength and also be with those there in the hospital, Lord, and give them comfort. As we continue in this service, we pray that uh, our minds will be clear from the outside noise and that our hearts are open to receive you. In Christ's name, amen. Faithful love flowing down. I'm going to be reading from Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's a lot of different themes in Scripture. We could talk about the theme of love or of grace, the theme of faith. But there is a very prominent theme of peace throughout the scriptures. More than 100 times in the New Testament, the word peace is used. And it's used in all kinds of different ways. It talks about, the scriptures do, they talk about how we can live at peace with God. We ought to live at peace with one another. But we can also live 
with peace within ourselves. Paul taught the Philippians that it is the peace of God that fills our hearts that truly makes the difference. I learned a, a little saying when I was young. When in danger, when in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. Well, Philippians chapter 4 says there's a whole lot better way to live. When things and circumstances and difficulties around you prevail, you don't have to run in circles and scream and shout. In fact, what you can do is with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, you can make your request known to God and the peace of God that surpasses every kind of human understanding will fill your hearts in Christ Jesus. Now that's a much better way to live. And in this world, there seems to be these days a constant parade of all kinds of problems and difficulties that can rob us of our peace and our calm assurance. There's illness and pandemic, there's death, there's terrorism, there's everything you can imagine right now and if you allow your lives to be focused on those things, you'll just want to run in circles and scream and shout. But let's let the peace of God prevail. And how do you experience God's peace in your life? When there's turmoil and there's angst and wickedness in the world, it is possible, you know, to live with an absolute peaceful heart, the kind of peace that the rest of the world doesn't understand. How do you do that? Well, primarily, you do that by drawing near to God. If you think you can be peace, uh, live with peace, peace in yourselves, peace with others, and be far, far away from God, you're only kidding yourselves. You have to draw near to God. That's where the sense of peace and that calm assurance comes from. I love the words of Psalms 36. Just listen. These won't be on the screen. But the psalmist tells us where true peace is found, and it's found in God. Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. You jump down to verse 10, and this is the song that we're very familiar with. Be still, be calm, be still, and know that I am God. And I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. Now, I can quote that verse a whole lot better than I can live by that verse. But the further away from God you are, or the closer to God you are, that determines how much fear and anxiousness will prevail in your life. It is only through Jesus that we have the kind of closeness that we need to have that brings peace. That's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 12, excuse me, verse 13, uh, 12 and 13, excuse me. But he says, now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, you were as far away from God as you could be, you have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ, for he himself is our peace. You see, when we keep our priorities in our life right, when we keep our focus on the kingdom, when we feel that closeness to God, fear doesn't take over. Problems don't control our lives. We live at peace with God and with our fellow man. That's what gave David the kind of confidence when he went into that valley to face that great big giant Goliath. Now there's no way that he could have possibly gone into that valley thinking that he had the ability to defeat a, a soldier like Goliath. But see, he knew he wasn't alone. Just like we do when we go into the world, we know we are never alone. He knew God was with him. His knees were not knocking. In fact, he trusted God completely. It's what gave the confidence of those three young Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they went into that fiery furnace. It's the same reason that Daniel could go into that lion's den. By the way, do you realize it was their closeness to God that got them in trouble? 
It was being close to God that sent them to the furnace, their loyalty to God. It was Daniel's faithfulness to God and his praying to God that got him in trouble. But it was their closeness to God that helped them through their ordeal and the fiery furnace and the lion's den. It's the same kind of story of Peter in Herod's prison. James had already been put to death. Herod saw that it pleased the Jews, so now he has Peter arrested, and he has every intention of putting Peter to death. And do you remember what Peter was doing? He was asleep. An angel had to wake him up in order to allow him to escape from prison. He was sleeping. He was trusting God. Whatever happens, he trusted God. And it's the reason Jesus could be sound asleep in a boat that's being tossed about by a storm on the Sea of Galilee. He was sound asleep. When everyone else was afraid for their lives, he was sleeping. And it's as the song says, the winds and the waves shall obey his will. Peace, be still. Whether the wrath of the storm tossed sea or demons or men or whatever it be, no water can swallow. As Jesus made his way to Calvary and he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is under a great amount of stress. So much so that sweat is pouring off of his body as he prays, Father, if you are willing, let this cup pass from me. But not my will be done, yours be done. That's the calm assurance. That's the peace that only God provides through his son, Jesus Christ, the kind of peace that this world will never understand. Let me close this portion with Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I quoted it last week. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, I don't have to know how that works. You don't have to know how to explain it to everyone else. We just know that when bad things happen in our lives, we have this calm assurance that no matter what happens, God is able to work it together for our good, and that gives us peace. As we approach the communion time of our worship and as we surround the table that God invites us to, we are reminded that we were once among those people who were far off, away from God and in our sin. But now we are no longer enemies of God. We're no longer far away. We are at his table. And the only way that we can sit at the table of a holy God is that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we give your name the praise and honor and glory that is due. Father, we thank you that you have taken those steps toward us, that you were the one that initiated peace with us. You were the one that sent your son to Calvary to die for our sins. So, Father, as we now break this bread, symbolizing the broken body of Jesus, we thank you that you are a God of peace and that we have peace with you. And we now remember your son who saved our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's another passage that 
when I think about peace, uh, I, this is the one that I go to most of all. I attended the wedding yesterday of Allison Bell, who is now Mrs. Ronald Johnson. And 1 Corinthians 13, which is predominantly the chapter that we read most of all at weddings, and it was yesterday, and rightfully so. But it's not the chapter I tend to read when I do a wedding. I go to Romans chapter 12. If you want your marriage to be the kind of marriage it needs to be, look at Romans chapter 12. If you want your relationships to be what they need to be, look at Romans chapter 12. If you want to know how you ought to live, you can go to 1 Corinthians 13, and you'll, it's wonderful. But I would also invite you to look deeply at Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. And serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. How do you do that? Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one for evil. Uh, repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. It's not your job. The contrary. Now he quotes from Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22 here. If your enemy is hungry, I'm not talking about your casual acquaintances. We're talking about those who persecute you, those who despise you, those who hate you, those that you have had issues with in the past. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I think what Paul is talking about is allowing God's grace to fill our hearts. It is literally impossible for you to live a peaceable life without the grace of God in your heart. It's impossible because without his grace, all of the guilt and all of the shame that you have felt because of your past wrongs, they continue and they haunt you. Without God's grace, we refuse to forgive those who have trespassed against us. And we harbor feelings of bitterness and resentment toward people who have hurt us in the past, and we allow that hurt to control us today. And without God's grace, we are really never drawn close to God the way the multitudes were drawn close to Jesus. Do you know why they were so attracted to Jesus? And it wasn't just because of his excellent teachings. And it wasn't just because of his marvelous miracles. It was because he offered people grace and he gave them a new beginning. That's why they love Jesus. But with God's grace filling your heart, all of that same guilt and shame, it just disappears and it vanishes away. And you live with a sense of full assurance and self-confidence in God and in yourself, knowing the joy of being one who is in Christ Jesus. And we can look forward with hope rather than looking backwards with regret. That's what God's grace allows us to do, but it has to fill our hearts so that we can live peacefully, uh, peacefully with other people. And the great test case has to be the Apostle Paul. I mean, he was the great persecutor of the church. He did things that, that should have been a burden to him for the rest of his life, and he should have felt regret. 
And how could a man who persecuted and enslaved and even put to death people of the, the Christians, how could he then go and sit right next to and worship with someone who was a Christian? Well, Paul explains it. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank him, we talk about God, I thank God who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointed me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. Did you catch the part where it says that the grace of our Lord overflowed for me? The NIV says it poured out abundantly. I don't know how much grace you think you need. I know that I need a lot, maybe even more than I know that I need. But however much grace you and I need, God has an abundance more than you need. That's why he is the God of peace. And a peaceful heart is one that is nestled, nestled and is resting in the grace and the mercy and the love of God. And he welcomes you to take, his, take your place in his kingdom, but more importantly this morning, at his table. Let's bow again. Father, we come and we approach confidently, not with any pride in our hearts, not with a self-confidence that thinks that we have done anything to um, make you obligated to love us and to save us. No, our confidence is not in us. We come boldly before the throne of yours because of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. And so, Father, now as we partake of the fruit of the vine that is symbolic of the blood of Jesus that was poured out for the many who are in this room and many, many more beyond that. Father, we again acknowledge your holiness, and it is through the blood of your Jesus that we can stand holy before you. And for that reason, we give you the thanks of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. As the pulpit minister of this church, I have been overwhelmed by your, your obedience and your generosity during this COVID-19 pandemic. And we have already completed our fiscal year of, uh, of the past. Now, as of uh, a week or so ago, we have started a new fiscal year. And we ended up very close to what our budget should be. Our spending was way, way down, but I wanna thank you for your generosity in continuing the work of this church during a very, very difficult time. And I know it's been very difficult for many of you personally, and so I thank you for that. And as always, uh, there are many ways to give. You can give personally. There'll be some boxes located at the exit on your way out. You can put your contribution in. Many of you are more and more taking advantage of online giving. I don't know how many people during the week drop their contribution by the church office or they drop it in that slot that is just outside the church office door. However you give to God, I want to say thank you. And so we are going to give thanks for the offerings that you have given the past week and for this week as well. Will you bow? Father, this is an amazing church and it's not incredible. It's not amazing because of who the preacher is or who the elders are. They're those shepherds are uh, great men of faith, but Father, we know that Christ Jesus abides in this church. 
And there is a tremendous love for Jesus and his kingdom and to see the gospel of, of grace and peace to be taught throughout all of this world. And so this congregation it gives generously, not because they are trying to merit or earn anything, but because they know that they have received grace and mercy from you free of charge. And so, Father, we give you thanks for the many contributions of this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, God, you are my God. And I'll be reading scripture from Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 6. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison, as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated, as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge adulterer and all sexually immoral. Keep your, keep your lives free from, from the love of money and be content with that you have, and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? just a moment I'll be reading from Galatians chapter 6 if you'd like to follow along. I appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts with you this morning though I apologize to, to those who heard this just four days ago. At our Wednesday night summit class this week I was asked to talk about the theme of spiritual weariness and here's the irony. After only two weeks of school I'm already worn out. I did not realize how much lung power it would take to teach in a mask, or how much elbow grease it takes to disinfect 40 desks four times a day, or how much stress is involved in teaching classes with some students in front of me and some literally 2,500 miles away. And what I've had to do is nothing compared to others. This is one hard-working community Think of the IT folks on the front lines battling internet problems, or the physical resources staff who have worked tirelessly to build hundreds of plexiglass shields for the classrooms, or administrators who spent months organizing this complex puzzle called pandemic education. And that's not to mention the doctors and nurses and researchers who are fighting every day to save lives. Although the summer is supposed to be a relaxing time for a college community, I think there's widespread sense that we are beginning the semester from a point of exhaustion. We've all been under emotional assault since March. The virus is frightening, the news is stressful, the election is contentious, the economy is bad, and having a hurricane in Arkansas did not help. And on top of that, there's no sports. 
Fortunately, the return of the students has energized us and given us hope, but they have come back to a changed place. We've asked them to forego some of what is great about the college experience, and now they're swamped with online quizzes and echo lectures and something called modules, all while having to stand six feet away from the people that they love the most. Since every area of life is affected, spiritual burnout cannot be far behind. That feeling that I've lost some of my spiritual drive, that the worries of the world are too much and I'm tired and I need a break from kingdom work. You don't have to be connected with the university to feel it. It's always been a danger for Christians. The godly life is demanding and we can easily grow weary from a packed schedule of ministry events. Plus, our work seems harder as the world moves further and further away from God. Add to that a virus that keeps us at arm's length from each other, and the weariness is inevitable. Jesus promised in John 16 that in this world you will have trouble. Fortunately, he told us to take heart, adding, I have overcome the world. So how do we overcome burnout? Look with me at Galatians chapter 6. I'll start reading at verse 2. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is not, he deceives himself. All of us should test our own actions. Then we can take pride in ourselves alone, without comparing ourselves to someone else, for each one should carry his or her own load. Skipping to verse 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I've always appreciated verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. I love Paul's honesty in admitting that it is easy to be worn out by a life of ministry. He of all people should know about that. But in this passage, he also provides the cure for spiritual burnout. It involves five steps. And yes, I realize you can also get burnout from listening to too many sermons with five points. Sorry about that. Point number one, focus more on serving other people. Carry each other's burdens, Paul says in verse 2. Now, at first glance, that sounds like a recipe for more weariness, not less. We may feel that our burdens are enough without piling on someone else's worries. When we are asked to carry more, we may complain that our backpack is full. But Paul is teaching here the power of perspective. Helping others takes the focus off of me and any negativity I may feel about my situation. Plus, it is a source of joy and spiritual energy. When I lived in North Carolina, I rented a room from an older woman at our church. Pauline was in, in her 80s and faced a number of serious health problems. She had insomnia and was always tired. She had a constant debilitating cough, along with arthritis and muscle aches. There was seldom a time in the day when something wasn't hurting. But in the times when she was crocheting hats and blankets for the homeless, or hand-painting t-shirts for children overseas, or hosting a Bible study in her home every single week, those aches didn't seem to matter so much. After a lifetime of Christian service, she could have easily decided to slow down, but she didn't. So whenever I think I have too many problems of my own to help others, I think about Pauline. Point number two goes hand in hand with the first. Don't be obsessed with yourself. That's a hard one because I confess I am my favorite subject. 
But Paul says in verse 3, if anyone thinks he is something when he is not, he deceives himself. Paul knows that the more inwardly we gaze, we can go one of two ways, neither of them is good. Either we inflate our ego or we dwell on the negative. As much as I benefit from counting my own blessings, I've also gotten to be pretty good at nitpicking my own blessings too. As Gustave Flaubert puts it in the novel Madame Bovary, I sometimes fall into the trap of discounting every joy because it is not a greater joy. That comes from too much thinking that it's all about me. In his third suggestion for avoiding spiritual burnout, Paul almost seems to contradict himself. Right after warning Christians against being puffed up, he tells them in verse 4 not to compare themselves to others, but instead to take pride in themselves alone. And then he says in verse 5, each one should carry his or her own load, right after saying we should carry things for others. But of course, the apostle is not confused at all. He's saying two things. The first is, even though we should help others to carry their burdens, each person must answer to God for him or herself. And the second point is that comparison is the enemy of contentment. I doubt I'm the first person to tell you that. Paul could not have anticipated social media, but he did know human nature. And he would not be surprised to see that we get tired constantly checking our feed to see how we measure up to others. Someone will always seem to be happier or richer or have better hair. I say seem because I imagine we waste a lot of energy envying people who are privately miserable. I recently heard this true story. <clears throat> These two guys lived next door to each other for years and carried on a bitter feud. It was one petty annoyance after another. Joe and Bob hated each other and eventually stopped speaking, but that didn't stop their resentment. After a few years, Joe noticed a fence going up between their houses. The construction was noisy and took forever and blocked his view. The longer the fence became, the angrier he got. Finally, he couldn't stand it and went to another neighbor to complain, can't you tell Bob to stop building that fence? The neighbor's son is the one who told me this story. His father said, Joe, Bob's not building that fence. He died four years ago. Talk about wasted energy. Comparisons can be draining even with people we like. We can hit spiritual burnout by constantly envying other Christians who seem to be doing more or giving more or having more Bible studies. It's one thing to be inspired by the service of others. It's another to act like ministry is a contest. That's what Paul's talking about when he says in verse 4, to have pride in yourself and not compare yourself with others. Your work in the kingdom matters, and God uses us all. Read 1 Corinthians 12 for more information about that subject. Paul's fourth cure for Christian weariness is expressed in verse 7. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The single greatest factor in spiritual burnout has to be sin, especially when we fail over and over in fighting the same struggle. Sin distracts us from doing good for others. It compromises our message. It wears out our confidence and it pushes us away from the path toward reaping eternal life. It is hard to fight against sin, but the only thing more exhausting than battling sin is giving in and watching it drain my joy. Do not become weary in well-doing. Whenever I read that verse, <clears throat> I think of my great uncle, 
C.T. Ragsdale. You may know his grandson, Scott, at Harding. I want to share a story about him that I told in a communion talk here 16 years ago. I hope it's not too soon to repeat it. <laughs> in 1990, Uncle C.T.'s wife, Margie, passed away. When the family was making arrangements, they asked him whether he wanted to hold the service at the funeral home or at the church. When he chose the chapel at the funeral home, the family assumed that the church might be too emotional, but that wasn't his reason. He said that when funerals are held in a church building, the casket is always down front, often in place of the communion table. If they had the funeral at the church, he wondered, what would happen the next Sunday when it came time to take communion? He was afraid that he would be thinking about his wife instead of thinking about his Lord. When I first heard this, I thought, surely he's being too hard on himself. After all, here's a man in his 80s who has served God his entire life, a faithful husband and father, a longtime elder in the church, a man who was mourning his wife of 60 years. Surely, I thought, God would understand if it's hard to focus during such a time of grief. Then I thought about Uncle C.T.'s life and about all the stories he had told me about his 30-year career with the City of Atlanta Fire Department. In a dangerous profession, the one constant for him had always been the sustaining presence of God. He told me about the time they were fighting a warehouse fire downtown. Uncle C.T. and his boss were standing outside the building discussing strategy when a backdraft explosion blew out the wall nearby. The chief was crushed to death under a pile of bricks. Uncle C.T. was standing only feet away and was not hurt. For the rest of his life, he was haunted by that event, and he told that story giving glory to God, humbled by God's mysterious providential care. He told me about the fire at the infamous Weinkauf Hotel when the supposedly fireproof building burned on December the 7th, 1946. It was, and still is, the worst hotel fire in U.S. history, with 119 dead. Every fireman in the city was called to duty, and Uncle C.T. worked for over 36 hours straight. He was nearly exhausted when he was given the additional gruesome assignment of escorting parents to the morgue. They had to identify the bodies of over 30 high school students who had been in town attending a convention. He said he'd been praying all day for strength and he was convinced that God's presence helped him through the hardest days of his career. Later, God sustained him through the saddest time of his personal life when he had to bury his own child. His son Thomas was also a firefighter, and one day on the job he ran into a burning home trying to rescue a colleague who he thought was trapped inside. As it turned out, his co-worker had already escaped. Thomas made it out alive, but the damage to his lungs was done, and he suffered miserably for a year before dying in his early 40s. Uncle C.T. might have been bitter over the seeming waste of life, but instead he was thankful that God had blessed his son with bravery and himself with endurance. As I thought about his life, I realized that his concern for losing focus during one communion service was part of a lifelong commitment not to grow weary in well-doing. His was a response of devotion to a God who had been with him every step of his life. He wasn't denying his own grief, but he felt the best way to honor his beloved wife was to meditate on the Savior who died for her. Uncle C.T. lived to be 95. During his lifetime, he probably took communion more than many of us ever will. But for him, every single time mattered. Let us not become weary in doing good, 
for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. That's the last strategy for dealing with spiritual burnout. We must refuse to give up. It is a choice. Being tired is not a choice. That will happen. But Paul suggests that we can choose not to be overcome with weariness. We can choose what to do when we are tired. So I'm re-energized about this semester. It will be a challenge, but older people than me have soldiered on in the face of weariness. Jesus himself certainly did. As he told his disciples again from John 16, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. We can't avoid weariness, but we can keep from giving up. May God bless us all with renewed energy and with his peace as we serve him in stressful times. Michael, thank you very much. And Will, you have done an excellent job leading our worship this morning. Uh, he mentioned that this was a lesson he did in the family room on Wednesday night, but it was pouring, raining outside, and so the crowd was very small, and I thought it was an excellent message, and so I, my mind started to uh, crank uh, inside, and I started, the wheels were turning, and, and I invited Michael, and he graciously accepted to do that again, because I thought it would be a message that would bless many people this morning in this auditorium, and especially online. And I know that during this time, he is not the only one that has felt weariness, and this is going on long enough. There may be others that are struggling right now, maybe hearts that are sad because of, of grief in your life. And so if you're feeling a sense of weariness or fatigue, it may be that peace of God isn't as strong in your life as you would like it to be, and you'd like the grace of God to fill your life more and more. There is a number up on the monitor, it's on the screen, and if there is anyone that needs prayers of this church, I'll be glad to pray with you right on the phone if you'll just call that number. But if there's anyone that seeks a reason that you'd like this church to pray for you, maybe you want to become a child of God this morning by turning your life over to Jesus, by confessing his name, turning away from sin and being immersed in the waters of Jesus. If there's anyone that would like to become a Christian today, again, call that number. We'll make any arrangements that are necessary. And I know that we, we can get a crowd here together that would love to witness you becoming a child of God this morning. So if there's anyone that has a need, after the close of this service, you can call that number. And now we invite Will to come and lead us in our closing song. Let's stand, please. In Christ alone, my hope is found.
seated, please. I ask you to be seated because our protocol, if you remember, is we're, we're kind of like a funeral, okay? We need to be dismissed by the ushers row by row. In fact, I was on campus out of the track the other evening, and there were some co-eds out there, and they were talking about all the new protocols and such, and one of them was complaining that after their class was over with, everybody just got up and walked right by them, and, and we need to honor our ushers directing after we have our closing prayer. Michael, I want to thank you for the lesson. It started out, I didn't think things was bad until you went through everything, and I'm, I'm going like, goodness, I really feel, but that was a great lesson. One thing from my Vietnam experience is uh, we got to do this a day at a time. We got to do it a day at a time. I had a friend that walked into a propeller that was going because he wasn't focused. So um, that's what we got to do. Okay. Why don't y'all bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the lesson that Michael shared with us today. The uncertainty of what's happening with the pandemic and with the turmoil in our country, schools starting, our own personal lives and how we're trying to figure out how to cope in our relationship with you. That seems to be overwhelming, but we know you're there for us. And if we concentrate on our relationship with you, that you'll see us through to the end. Bless each individual that is here, each individual that's watching online and virtually, and may not just in a sense have a good week, but have a good day tomorrow, a good day in which we honor you and draw strength from you. These are our prayers. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.